Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, very pleased to present today's webinar on the topic of phytanic acid analysis and interpretation, laboratory and clinical considerations in diagnosis and, and follow up. Um, oh, hold on, I'm just having difficulty advancing slides. Um, let me just see, good. So uh, my name is Susan Karanoff. Um, I am co-founder and vice president of the Global Dare Foundation, and I am uh, very happy to be your host today. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Professor uh, Jean-Marc Neufer, senior consultant for meta metabolic, metabolic analysis and mitochondrial diseases at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, his team in Bern is made up of pediatric and adult medical specialists for areas of inborn metabolism, specialized dietitians, social workers, nurses, labor techni laboratory technicians, as well as research staff dedicated to the errors of uh, inborn errors of metabolism. Professor Neufer is also a lecturer on this topic at the University um, Medical Faculty medical faculty at the University of Bern, as well as being involved in the creation of national policies for orphan diseases in Switzerland. Uh, before I pass the presentation over to Dr. Neufer, I'd like to share a little bit about the Global Dare Foundation, as well as speak to a few housekeeping details for today. So the Global Dare Foundation was established in October of 2019. Dare stands for Defeat Adult Wrestling Everywhere. Our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for all of those who are impacted by adult wrestling's disease. Our goal is to support research, education initiatives, awareness campaigns, and advocacy. Also driving research is at the center of what we do because we dare to believe that there is a cure for adult wrestling. With the support of our medical and scientific advisory board, we are raising awareness for RESM, driving better treatment and care, and reinvigorating research into better therapies for RESM disease. Now, as I said, just a couple of uh, housekeeping details. So for your information, all participants are currently in listen mode only. At the end of the presentation, we'll take questions. Uh, participants who are following the webinar on Zoom can type their questions in the chat box at any time during the presentation, or they can raise their hand at the end to ask a question live. Participants who have joined the call uh, via phone, via phone can press star nine on the phone to raise their hand. And at the end, questions will be answered in the following order. First, Q&A box in Zoom. Then we'll turn to dial in participants and then any online participants who want to ask the questions orally. Also, today's session will be recorded for later viewing on the Global Dare Foundation website in the events section. So with that, now I will turn over the presentation to Dr. Nwerfer. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> hello, thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very honored to have this speech uh, about this Phytanic acid analysis and interpretation. Actually, my story in um, paroxysomal disorder started 30 years ago because I did then my doctoral thesis on, on rhizomelic chondrodysplasia punctata. And in the, uh, in the last then past uh, 30 years, I was then trained as metabolic specialist and also as I worked part-time in the lab as a, a lab biochemist. So that's, that's my background and I work on one side in the clinical side and on one side in the lab. And in Switzerland, we have a very centralized way in that for peroxisomal disorders, all the analyses are actually done in, in, in our lab in, in Bern. So next slide. So ideally, if, if you imagine now an, an, an test, a diagnostic test for a disease, then as, as you see in the upper right part, you would, have, you would like to have a test that uh, clearly uh, separates the, the healthy persons from the person that have a certain group of disease, like for instance, peroxisomal disorder, or even a specific disease as adult resume 
uh, disease. So if this test would get all positive, all true positive, then we call that, we, we say the test would have very high sensitivity. But you would also like that the tests would, that all the negatives, so if the test is normal, you would exclude all those patients. So, so you don't miss uh, um, uh, patients that have the disease. Now, actually, this is, if you want, wishful thinking, because a lot of, of, of those laboratory tests that we use do not have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And this is actually uh, also for titanic acid analysis an important thing to, to know, and I will come back to that. Then a test may be also used for follow-up. Now, in the follow-up, it is important that if you, um, if you develop a test, usually you develop a test that is very sensitive in the region where you want to discriminate patients from healthy persons, so in a certain range of concentration. And very frequently, patients have very high concentration, and in this very high concentration, the same test that you apply for diagnostic purposes may not have, may not be as exact, and uh, one can evaluate the, the preciseness, if you want, of this test at different levels, and this determines how good you can differentiate one value from the other, and I will come back to that. This we call critical difference. And then also, especially in rare disease, one important thing is uh, as, as patients frequently go from, from eventually one center to another, how, how comparable are actually the methods that are used in the different laboratories that, that do phytanic acid analysis. And it's all about these things that I, I would like to, to explain. So next slide. Next slide, please. So the question that arises from this is actually uh, uh, for the diagnosis of, of peroxisomal disorders or patients with adult Refsum disease. Do all patients with elevated phytanic acid have really a peroxisomal disorder or specifically adult Refsum disease? And on the other side, do all patients that have a normal phytanic acid, acid do they have excluded and, and peroxisomal disorder or adult Refsum disease. Then as a second question in this diagnostic part is how specific is, if you have an elevated uh, phytanic acid concentration, how specific would that be for either a peroxisomal disorder or here a, a specific adult Refsum disease? Or what, what other factors could lead to, to eventually uh, elevated uh, phytanic acid. And for the follow-up, um, the question would rather be, if you measure different concentration of, of uh, uh, phytanic acid, are the differences that you measure, I, I mentioned here some uh, uh, examples like, is 16 micromolar really different from 13? Is that a therapeutic effect or just a methodological effect due to the uh, imprints in, in to, the, to the technical problems of the measurement? Is 46 different from 36? So there is like, as it is more frequently, the high concentration is 370 and 250 really explained by the uh, by the message, just by the, uh, or is it really, could that be also a therapeutic effect? I will come to, to, all, uh, to all these questions. And then uh, what I already mentioned, how comparable are the uh, values between different laboratories? And as you may know, actually most of these laboratory, almost 100, uh, almost, yes, 100 laboratories participate in international quality assurance and compare really those measurements. So I will show you the comparability between those different laboratories. Then next slide, please. But to start with, I, I would like to introduce maybe most of you, I think, know, but, but still 
actually the, the phytanic acid that we measure in, in the blood is coming from the diet in, in humans. And in order that it is metabolized, it has to enter the cell, but it has also to enter the peroxisome. Um, and it needs, uh, so it needs those peroxisomes. And then you have a whole machinery where these branch chain fatty acids are first alpha oxidized. You see that in these uh, uh, reactions on the, on the right hand side. And, um, but in order that they are degraded, one of the first enzymes, this fetanoyl coa hydrolase, which is the deficient enzyme in, in Refsum disease, this enzyme actually has to be imported from the cytoplasm, so from the cell, in these peroxisomes. And of course, uh, um, if, if the enzyme is here but not imported, then you also have uh, um, an elevated uh, fetanic acid. And to import this enzyme that degrades the, the fetanoyl coa, um, you need different proteins that are, that are encoded as, as PEX proteins. So next slide. And when we are doing a diagnostic in, in, in just a suspicion of, of a peroxisomal disorder, then we have in the lab different parameters that we can measure. And you see um, here in, in, in blue the, the different uh, metabolic pathways, so the fatty acid, beta oxidation, where if you have a, a deficiency there, we can measure metabolites in, uh, the, of the very long chain fatty acids that are frequently measured together with titanic acid. We can measure bile acids or pristanic acid, which actually is a, a product of degradation of, of the phytanic acid. Or you can measure the other uh, metabolites, other pathway that will give you an idea whether uh, how, what, what type of, of, of defect you have in these peroxisomal disorders. And of course, for uh, Refsum disease, it is mainly the phytanic acid or eventually the pristanic acid that we are interested in if we do targeted um, analysis. But if you don't have the peroxisome at all, you, you will have a lot of other uh, parameters that may be elevated uh, together with the phytanic acid, as, as you see here. So next slide. Now, I, I don't want to go very much into detail, but I think it is important to know that uh, whenever you get blood, uh, that blood is drawn from a patient, you cannot just directly inject this blood in an in a analyzer and this will give you a, a result of, of the phytanic acid. So there are different chemical steps that you have to do to actually isolate the, the free and the, the um, bound esterified fatty acids and so also the phytanic acid to then at the end, what, what you see in, the, in this red bottle, to inject that in, in, in your analyzer. And the, analyze, the analyzer, the type of analyzer that is usually used to measure phytanic acid is usually a gas chromatography mass spectrometry uh, method. And actually what you get there is what you see at, in the lower part, we call that a chromatogram where you see different peaks and the marked red peak would here correspond to the um, uh, phytanic acid and the uh, peaks more on the uh, right hand side are, are uh, very long chain fatty acids. And it's by integrating this, this uh, peak, so taking the era of, of this peak of phytanic acid and by uh, extra Operating that to, to an internal standard where we know the concentration, you can then calculate what is the, the uh, concentration in, in the patient. Now, uh, next slide. Now there are um, different methods that actually were published um, and that were validated. And most these methods, as I already mentioned, 
uh, use this gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Most of these methods actually use, we call that the one point calibration. So they use one standard of phytanic acid where we know the concentration and um, the concentration then in the blood sample is uh, calculated back from the error, you know, from this internal standard. And obviously different groups, I, I mentioned here just some examples on the slide, then published uh, in, in what range uh, you can measure this phytanic acid and within what range you can actually measure uh, this in a linear way. So the, the, the peaks correspond linearly to this standard. And usually what, what you find in literature is concentration, something between five and 80 or 100 micromolar are described as, as linear. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at how precise uh, one can measure that, um, the, depending on the range uh, between these five and 100 micromolar, people say or describe that it is either very uh, precise around 1.7% um, of, of coefficient of variation, I will come back to this, or uh, rather 10%. Now this is, this is this percent of this coefficient of variation is an important measure um, of the exactitude of, of the measurement. And I will, I will come uh, back to this in, in the next slide now. Thank you. Next slide. So because this, um, the difference between two measurements um, of, a, of a healthy individual, so every, every parameter that you measure in an in, in individual may have intra-individual variation. So this is something that, that uh, is one part that makes the difference from one to the other measurement. But another part is actually the analytical reproducibility of what you measure. And that's, that's, what, we, um, uh, that's what we call this coefficient of variation, or that's a marker of the reproducibility. And on the left-hand side, I just showed a series of 10 measurements of the same sample. And there, then you can calculate the mean value and the standard error. And the ratio of the standard error and the mean value give you, gives you this coefficient of variation. So in this example of phytanic acid measurements, that is somewhere the mean of, of 7.44, we have a coefficient of variation of this 0 0.06 uh, or 6%. So this means that 6% um, of variation around this 10 micromolar is, would be explained by the, uh, uh, if you want, the inexactitude of, of the, 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 this method. And uh, the change uh, can be calculated with this formula uh, that I mentioned here, this critical dif difference, which is 2.8 times this uh, coefficient of, of, of variation. And this gives you the, the really the critical difference that uh, is explained by the variability of the method. Uh, if you measure a same point at repeated measurements. So if you take now these 10 micromolars um, and you say you, you apply this critical difference, then this would mean that 16.8% plus minus around 10. So this 8.32 to 11.68 would just be explained by the ana analytical reproducibility. So whether you measure 8.4 or 11, this is just explained by the analytical reproducibility. And of course, if the uh, reproducibility gets less, as you will see in certain cases, 
then these critical differences get bigger and bigger. So next slide. Now I will first come back to when you are in a lab, actually, you don't know necessarily what the patient has because you don't necessarily always, we do not always get the clinical information. So um, actually, fictanic acid elevations may be to different groups of, of disorders. And I try to summarize this here. So one would be the peroxisomal biogenesis disorders as for instance, Selvager spectrum disorders like, like Selvager syndrome or neonatal adrenal dystrophy or infantile rhythm. And those patients may actually have uh, normal or, or, or elevated fetanic acid, but frequently it, it gets elevated only in the, um, with the uh, time on. But they all have all these peroxisome biogenesis disorder, they have other markers, as I mentioned before, that will also be, or that would also be elevated. And then you have the single peroxisomal enzyme deficiencies as the adult refsome disease. And they're usually, as, as you know, in most textbooks, it's written that patients with refsome disease usually have highly or 10 to 100 fold elevated um, titanic acid. And isolated fetanic acid compared to the uh, patients with alpha uh, methylacyl coa racemase deficiency, which also have um, the phytanic acid elevated, but also the pristanic acid. So there it's important also to, to measure the pristanic acid, but the other um, um, markers like uh, very long chain fatty acids or, or bile acids would not be elevated in, in, in uh, these defects. And then we have, I think, uh, frequently we, we forget that we have a very rare group of, of patients where actually we have uh, repeatedly elevated um, titanic acid and we actually do not find uh, um, defect even if we send the fibroblasts to run wonders, even if we do genetic analyze, we just don't find uh, an explanation. Uh, in my experience, these are, are mainly um, children that have a, 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 um, where we usually suspect an, an, an per rather a peroxisome, general peroxisomal disorder, but, but then we have this isolated titanic acid and they uh, we don't find actually a genetic defect. So next slide. So coming back to the to the questions I, I raised at the beginning concerning the, the diagnosis. So uh, some peroxisomal disorders, as I already mentioned, may have normal phytanic acid, but, but what about adult refsome disease? Now, um, I, I found two in, in, in uh, PropMed, I, I found only actually one, one presentation or one uh, paper on, on two patients that were described from, from a French group with uh, um, that initially had, had normal phytanic acid. And later, uh, 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 Refsum disease was genetically uh, um, uh, shown. But in your, I found actually in your previous talk that you had, um, that was in April 2021, so recently, you had a talk from Dr. Radha Ramachandran, and she presented actually, I probably, of her own experience, two patients that, that um, uh, had apparently um, normal, repeatedly even normal phytanic acid, the first patient being misdiagnosed as a mitochondrial disorder um, and, and only found years later having, having um, uh, Refsum's disease and then a second family were actually uh, 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 the brother then, or in the brother, this this then led to the to the diagnosis of of uh, um, 
uh, Drefsum disease because in, in the brother, then finally the, the elevated titanic acid was, was shown and then the, the, the first uh, patient then was, was looked for also and then it was, it was uh, this misdiagnosis then was, was clear. So there are apparently um, patients with adult Refsum's disease that have either very mildly or, or even normal elevated uh, phytanic acid. So you may miss with the biochemical testing actually some patients. That's why actually it is very important not to just believe what, what, we, what you have as lab results, but, but really rely also on the clinical presentation. I think um, a lot of patients mentioned that already. If you have a retinitis pigmentosa, if you have those anomaly, if you have some other symptoms that you cannot explain, just go to genetic analysis to, to exclude this. So next slide. So this would mean actually that if you use just phytanic acid analysis for diagnostic purposes, um, so these are the, I, I, will, I will go to the answers for, for diagnostic purposes, then actually in the general population, uh, this, this isolated phytanic um, acid elevation May, may have other causes as the other causes of, as the other diseases of peroximo, peroxisomal disorders. And some patients, we don't even find the genetic, uh, we don't find a PEX defect or another defect. So they are still unclear. So we have some patients that have elevated, and we still don't know what they have on the genetic level. On the other side, there seems to be very rare cases of also adult Refsum's disease that have uh, very marginally elevated phytanic acid or even normal phytanic acid. So if you have a clinical su suggestive uh, presentation, then you should pursue either uh, enzymatic or genetic analysis to exclude um, uh, adult Refsum disease. And of course, phytanic acid is not specific for uh, uh, adult Refsum disease. And um, uh, you have factors, especially in patients where, where it is the, 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 the diet or also catabolic states uh, where um, this may lead to a high, higher uh, uh, phytanic acid level in, in, in patients. So next slide. Now, in the follow-up, the, the, if you use this titanic acid analysis for the follow-up, um, you usually have much higher levels of this titanic acid than, than where we have the, where we have the um, defined reference range. So uh, there it is, and there actually in these high levels, as you have a, a dietary treatment, we would be actually interested to be sure that the differences that we see are really due to the, due to the therapy that, that one makes. So it is important to know what I introduced, what, what is the critical difference that can be explained just by the analytical part and what is the, the part that is just Due, um, or that is really due to, the, to a potential treatment that, that one does. And I will come to that in, in, in now the next slide. Because if you look, I mentioned at the beginning, you see that on the lower left part that actually in the diagnostic era, so where the reference range is and where you want to discriminate healthy from uh, people that have a, a disease that affects phytanic acid, these, uh, these measurements are very linear and you can use this single, um, uh, this single point calibration. But I show here if you have very higher on the right part um, of, of this graph, the, you have the higher concentrations of, of the phytanic acid and what you see if you extrapolate this, this um, 
line, um, this is not linear anymore. And you almost get something like a, a quadratic uh, fitting. So it's, you, cannot, you cannot just extrapolate from um, these intensities that you measure or from these uh, errors that you measure uh, the, the real concentration. So you have above a certain level, you have to dilute your sample to get again in this linear range. And next slide. I just want to show you the effect if you, if you don't do this. Um, this is on, on this graph, you see the red dots are repeated um, measurements that were uh, diluted to get in the li linear range. And the red dots are the measurements you get if you don't dilute um, your samples. So what you see is that actually you get always very much higher or way too high concentrations if you don't dilute the sample. And this of course is because you, you, it's, it's not linear in this uh, range anymore. Now, Actually, um, I must say that for years, uh, uh, actually here in Bern, we did not really realize this. And, and um, so I think also some, some other labs do not necessarily always dilute um, the samples. And I'm not sure whether really all um, uh, concentrations in very high levels are always completely uh, right because they may not be in the linear range of the method. Uh, now, next slide. Um, we evaluated uh, some years ago the effect of in here in the lab in Bern. Um, and you see that on the, on the table here on the left hand side, we have these low levels around five, so normal levels. And here you see that at these uh, five mi micromolar levels, you have very good repro reproducibility. So the coefficient of variation is around 9%. So this is quite good for such a method. And if you are around the, uh, um, the upper level of the reference range, so where I wrote high level, so this 15, then you still are, you still have a very good uh, coefficient of, of, of variation. And also this critical difference is, is quite nice. But if you go then to very high levels like 300 or, or 900, um, then, and then you look at the reproducibility, then you have the coefficient of variation rises to around 15 or 20%. And the effect of this high coefficient of variation on this critical difference is, is shown here at where I wrote analytical range. So it's huge actually, the differences that are just explained by the inexactitude of, of the method. So in this range, you cannot really say, is this a therapeutic effect or is this just the impreciseness of, of the method, which I think is, is, is important to, to realize. So, and next slide. So I mentioned at the beginning, th these three different concentrations. And if you come back to this now, and if you look at the coefficient of variation in those ranges, then one would have to say that 16 and 14 um, uh, uh, micromolar phytanic acid um, is actually uh, the same. So it's, it's, it's explained by the uh, critical difference. Whereas 46 and 33 would be a real difference, not explained just by the analytical variability, but probably must more, much more interesting is that in higher levels where we have this 15% coefficient of variation, 
actually 350 and 250 are explained by the analytical difference. So getting from 350 to 250 will not, could not just be explained by a, by a therapeutic effect. Next slide. Now, actually, to, to answer how comparable these problems are between different labs, I took the, we, we all participate on international quality assurance. And here you show, I show you graphs from um, around uh, 80 labs that participated in ERNDIM. ERNDIM is an international quality assurance program where each lab gets the same phytanic acid sample and has to measure the, the, the concentration. They, then they give the concentration they may measure. And this allows to, to show and to compare the, the, the values between labs. So what you see in the lower part of the graph in the different colors are uh, labs that use different methods. So the blue is one method, the yellow is one method, and where you see the cross, you see where, where our lab is. Um, and then what you see actually on the left-hand side of these uh, um, graphs is the concentration range uh, that uh, the results were given. So what I want to show here is actually with this that the different methods that are used are quite comparable. And this you can say because they are Usually, I mean, we have a lot more of these graphs. They are usually quite homogeneously all distributed uh, uh, the same along the range of the results that are given by the different labs. Uh, but you see that the, uh, the, you, you can, the same way as for a single lab, you can calculate actually how precise or how the variability is between those uh, labs by taking all these results of this single, uh, single measurements. And I will come back later to this. But here in the left-hand side, so the lower labs would have given like 14 and the, some labs had even uh, values that were over 30. So that's the range. So if you um, translate this to clinical meaning, then this was mean probably at 14, you would rather not suspect an, an, uh, a pathology, but at over four, at over 30, um, this would be above the, the, the usual reference ranges. So there you could eventually suspect uh, uh, an um, disorder that affects uh, um, the phytanic acid oxidation. And this is actually similar for different ranges uh, as, as I show for, for the next, uh, for the slide actually on the right side. Um, so even around the diagnostic uh, decision point, you have labs that would say it's normal and some that would say it's elevated. Then um, next slide. Now, this actually shows the, um, the, the, this, this uh, international quality assurance in, in, in numbers. And what I want to show here is actually that if, where you see the first line mean phytanic acid, that's the mean of all values of that, that we had in those quality assurance. And, the and at the lowest, you see this coefficient of variation. So the important thing is that if I go back actually, actually more than two, even three years, we never had a sample that was, that was in the therapeutic range. So we never had very highly elevated phytanic acid. So we cannot compare uh, the interlab um, reliability in, 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 
high values because all the values that we had were around 20 or, or very low, like 0 0.7, the first, of the, the first in the list. And you also see that this coefficient of variation between the labs obviously are much higher than if you looked at, at just our lab. <clears throat> So next slide, this brings me actually to the summary of, of, of to the conclusion. So I think pythanic acid analysis is a good method to screen for, uh, uh, for elevated value. And it was also developed to diagnose, to diagnose peroxisomal disorder or, or elevation of phytanic acid. But one has to realize, I think, that isolated high phytanic acid is, is, I think in most cases, is a good indicator of adult rhesum disease, but you have probably some patients that you may miss, and you have some patients that have isolated, elevated uh, phytanic acid, especially, in, at least in my experience, our pediatric patients, and in some of those, we don't even find a uh, reason why. And of course, they don't have the typical clinic of, of Refsum patients, these patients. Then, uh, uh, I already mentioned it, but I think it's important. You may miss, therefore, the diagnosis of adult Refsum disease, and therefore, if you have, genet uh, if you have clinical suspicion, you should go further to either biochemical or genetic exclusion of, of the disease. And in Switzerland, we rather go, if we are not sure about a certain disease, we rather go now to panel analysis, for instance, for, for uh, retinitis pigmentosa, rather than single uh, disorders, if we cannot point to a single, if we are not sure about a single uh, disorder that we now, at concentration near the cutoff, somewhere between 15 and 20, this test performs very well and has a low cutoff, but at high levels, one has to be um, careful. And I think this is important, especially if you compare the effects between different patients. What, what is this, this critical difference? And um, last, I think the, the, the quality assurance data that I showed you between the different labs, I think um, at, at the diagnostic level, we are very good The different labs. I think this works quite well, but we do not have any quality assurance really for high levels. So this brings me to the last slide and to the end of my speech. And this is the view if I look outside of uh, the window where I am right now, more or less, at least the mountains, I don't see the church. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Neufer. You're very lucky to have that view. Although I'm located in Switzerland, um, I don't see the mountains like you do. I'm a bit too far away. <laughs> uh, there was a very interesting presentation. Um, it was highly technical and um, you imparted some very important information on us. And I expect that there, there may be several questions that our, our listeners may have um, that may, may probe you with a bit more clarification, um, especially with regards to um, the phytanic acid uh, level results. And um, maybe I'll just kick off the, the question and answer discussion with a question myself. So if I, if I understood correctly at higher uh, levels of concentration, the, the results for phytanic acid uh, testing will have greater variation and therefore yes. results need to be um, interpreted uh, with caution. So if we consider somebody whose um, phytanic acid levels tend to vary, um, I can take myself for instance, as you know, you've seen my results, um, sometimes they may be up at, at 800 and the next time down, down to 500. Um, so in the most cases, is this attributed to a change in, um, in clinical situation or is it highly attributed to the, the lab variation? Mm -hmm. Can, can uh, you speak to that yes. easily? 
Yes, I think there are, there are two things that contribute to that. I mean, one thing we don't know in the lab when we look at this, this is how, uh, how strictly you did the diet, obviously. Um, and this we don't know. Or how catabolic you are, and this we don't know. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then is this analytical thing that I try to explain. So I think if, if at, at, for instance, the example that you took between uh, like, like six or 500, 100 or 200 difference will, will, could also be explained just by the technical uh, impreciseness. This could be the case, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the, the thing in the diet is if you, if you start like with very high levels and then you do a, 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 a diet or even a dialysis, I don't know, then you will have uh, uh, consequently a drop of these, of these values. And by having several values in a row, you will be, it, it is more um, east or more um, easier to explain to what it is. It's just this analytical part explains in high values can, can, can be a cause of high variation. Yes, I think this is uh, important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also the, I mean, the comment that you made that you're not certain that all of the labs testing phytanic acid actually dilute the samples, um, you know, when the results tend to be um, at at higher range. So probably again, this would be an interesting point at the this quality assurance meeting that we, we we exchange that between the labs once to see whether this is really done or how how they dilute it also and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll turn to any of the uh, questions that have been posted in the chat. If you do have any questions, then please feel free to post them. I see that there are currently um, some questions in, in the chat. Um, so the first question, um, apart from phytanic acid, do you think there are um, additional biomarkers that are indicative of Ressam disease? Um. Well, we don't know. I don't think, I think for, for Refsum disease really, uh, for the adults, sorry, Refsum disease, this is really the, the biomarker. Maybe it is, as I mentioned, to measure also the pristanic acid is important to differentiate between those two forms that may lead to, iso or to nearly isolated phytanic acid because there is this single rare enzyme defect that can present quite similar to, to Refsum's disease. So the pristanic acid, but this is usually measured in the same method simultaneously as, as a, a phytanic acid. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, further question. Um, with regards to explaining extreme elevation in phytanic acid levels, from one year to another. So for instance, from 243 milligrams per liter in 2021 versus 46.3, um, that for an adult Refsum patient who has been strictly following the diet, could such a high variation be considered an error or is this a reason to be concerned? Um. Now you use other, um, other uh, measures. Can you repeat the concentration maybe just shortly? Yeah, 243 milligrams per liter versus 46.3 milligrams per liter. Well, I cannot exclude. I mean, if 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 the the uh, if the sample was not diluted, I think this could be possible because there you you can really have huge then differences of of this titanic acid. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
where, where really it's, it's uh, like more than, I mean, it's in the four, it is in the range of fourfold or fivefold um, differences. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, it might be worthwhile for this individual to perhaps check back with their lab to, to you know, exactly. question the technology, right? I think this is really the important thing. The lab frequently does not know what you have some, or, or does not know the, the, if it measures sometimes if you are already a known patient. And if you, the labs that know that you are a known patient, usually I would think start to dilute it already at the beginning. But if they don't know, they just do it as we do it in the routine. And then they measure it undiluted. Um, and then eventually they will not do a second essay with the diluted sample. So I, but you, I, I think the best answer is really what you, what you just mentioned is just, if you think this is not believable, what the labs gives you, call or ask the lab. <laughs> because we also make mistakes. <laughs> and this, I mean, we, we also had, uh, I, can, I can mention this, I mean, we also, we normally don't dilute the sample. So we had a, a case where we forgot to then calculate back that we had 10 times diluted. And this of course also then leads to an error. Yeah. So uh, just ask back, back the lab, it's better than, yeah, okay. Um, all right, we've, um, in our Refsum community, we also have some, some parents of children with infantile Refsum disease. And there's a question here. Um, my son has infantile Refsum. Are the level measurements of phytanic acid different from ARD from a child? So the question is whether whether uh, 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 infantile refsum has has uh, other levels than adult refsum. Are the level measurements of PA different from ARD from a child? Well, uh, the, usually, um, I would say they are rather a little bit lower, and the other levels of the very long chain fatty acids are also elevated. Uh, which are not, and these are not elevated in, in um, so the constellation of the um, is completely different. And also the pristanic acid will be uh, elevated that you see, that you usually see in this GCMS analysis in, in uh, infantile refsum. So you have another constellation of the lab parameters or also of these peaks that you see in this chromatography. Right, right, okay. Um, okay, uh, next question. How many people have you found with high phytanic acid with no nerve damage? Uh, I must say this I cannot answer. I don't know. Um, I think this is uh, something that maybe one could answer if you have a registry, you do all, you put all these patients in that have elevated phytanic acid in the registry, and then you control them also neurologically. But, but I, 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 I could not answer that. I don't know. I don't think we really have this data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like you said, when you get results for phytanic acid testing, you don't know much. You don't know anything about the patient and what they have. You're, you're, you're just purely testing the, the phytanic acid. Yes, if it's patient from outside, we don't necessarily get the clinical information. Right. From the patients inside the hospital or some, some doctors give us the, the clinical information, but in most cases, we don't get that in the lab. Right. From a, from a lab perspective, would you want to have that clinical information always? Oh yes, I think this is very important because then you could, you could much more precise, because most, I mean, from the investigation point of view, if you don't know what a patient has, then uh, you could really uh, also discuss about, about other analyzes and advise the doctor eventually about other analyzes that, that have to be done. So I think this is actually 
in the in the field of inborn errors or rare diseases that is i think what we usually do we in most cases actually we get clinical information not not for very long chain fatty acids or phytanic acids, but for most other diseases, we get some information. Yeah, okay, uh, that, that's good to know. Okay, um, a, a further question, I'm not certain whether you can answer this, but I'll ask it anyway. Which changes are found in a skin biopsy? No, I can, uh, unfortunately, I, I have no experience with skin biopsies. You mean in, in adult refsum? Um, yeah, I, is it perhaps a question of, of fibroblast testing? I mean, in fibroblast testing, one can do a lot of different tests. One can do all these enzymatic analyses of the different enzymes. Um, one can do in the supernatant, you can do, so in the culture media of these fibroblasts, you can do analyses. Um, but... Um, we don't do this uh, for, for uh, refsum disease. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And also for the, uh, for the enzymatic analysis, we actually send that to the Netherlands. To Professor Wanders, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, we're at the end of the, the session. Um, I don't think that there's um, any further questions in, in the chat. If I've missed anything, um, what I'll do, um, uh, Dr. Neufer, is I'll, I'll send you the questions um, so that we could maybe have a typed up answer to them, any questions that we've missed. And then we also like to post our question and answer um, on our website as well. Okay, that's fine for so, me. And with that, um, I would like to say a big thank you for this great presentation that you provided today. It was, was very helpful and, and insightful to us. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the participants for joining today and uh, your continued support to the, the Global Dare Foundation. Um, so with that, I wish you um, a good rest of the day and, uh, and take care. Thank, thank you. you.